Hi, I'm Jim Brule. I'm a Magid, which means I'm a transformational storyteller. Some might call me a spiritual storyteller. And I'm glad that you've decided to take the time to learn more about transformational storytelling, how it works, and what it would take for you to become a transformational storyteller. But most of you probably never heard the term transformational story before, so what exactly does it mean? Well, a transformational story is a particular type of story that invites the audience, and inevitably the teller, to meaningfully change. Now, it doesn't promote a particular change. It doesn't demand that uh, the audience adopt a certain set of beliefs or views. No, it invites change into the lives of each member of the audience and the storyteller and ultimately their families, their societies, the communities that are so often fractured. Uh, it really can be the basis for healing the rifts within us and among us. I've used transformational storytelling in a variety of settings on, on both coasts to help communities come together and heal, but also to do great internal work with individuals as they listen to these stories. Now, you can't get a transformational story to off the shelf, you know, read it to somebody and say, bang, you're transformed. No, it has to be the right story at the right time for the right people. And it has to be told skillfully and with an open heart. So when you approach a situation and you think, boy, this, this situation is ripe for a transformational story, you have to know which story to bring forward, how to tell it so in a way that engages people, but also how to tell it with an open heart so that their hearts open as well. So it's not easy, but I can tell you it can be done and it's wonderful. So in this video, what we're going to talk about is first a little bit about why do we tell stories at all. That's kind of the themes throughout the whole video. We're going to speak ab about how we change and learn, and we're going to draw in some neuroscience to make that clear, as well as what makes stories so effective. Also, we'll be beginning to address the question of how can we make our stories more transformational, keep it the brown groundwork for how we get that done. But as I said, I'm a storyteller, so I have to begin with a story that kind of illustrates um, some of the things that can happen. And this is a story, um, stories you should know that are told by transformational storytellers. They can be personal, they can be um, scriptural, they can be folklore. It's what we do to a story that makes it transformational. The first story I'm going to share with you tonight is a personal story. Um, it's a story that happened to me uh, many years ago. I was visiting, uh, along with my wife, uh, my daughter, who lived at the time in India. And uh, she really had had enough of India at that point. She'd been there for a few years. And she wanted to visit somewhere else. I said, well, where would you like to go? She said, I'd like to go to Nepal. Well, I have to tell you, Nepal's been on my bucket list for a long time, so I was ready to go. It happened that when we went there, it wasn't the best time to be there. On the other hand, it was probably the best time to be there, and that's because there was a lot of violence at the time. There were terrorists that were uh, setting off bombs and scaring away tourists. So we showed up there anyway um, and found ourselves in a country that was really closer to its a uh, non-touristy state that one would mostly find. And we visited the old cities, but what we really wanted to do was get up into the foothills and to see the mountains. Um, and so we found a guide, and he took us on a trail up through the foothills of the Himalayas. Now, these are the very low foothills, so this is a picture we took along the way. And you can see there's a house. It's actually a little uh, community off there, about midway down. But there weren't very many people around. There was this tiny little dirt path that we were walking, and we're just traipsing through the mountains. Um, now, in that part of the world, especially in rural Nepal, people don't speak a lot of English. Even my daughter, who speaks Hindu, wasn't able to, to speak the native language there. So we really relied on our, our uh, translator to help us understand what the occasional person that we met would say to us. Well, as we're walking along, 
I looked up one of the hills, and, and there at the top of the hill, there was this little orange flag. You can see it if you look real close on this picture. Way at the top, barely visible. And I said to the guide, whose name was Babu, I said, Babu, um, what's that flag for? He said, oh, there's a Hindu temple up there. Um, and uh, the flag is so that if people have to you know, make a sacrifice or come and do some prayers, uh, they know where to go. And I, I noticed the windy trail up the top. It was actually pretty steep. I said, do you think it'd be okay if we went up to visit? He said, sure, go ahead. So the three of us went up, others stayed down, and we made our way up towards the, towards the flag, back and forth. Now, as we got towards the very top of the hill, before we kind of crested the top, this young man ran over to us from the top of the hill, <clears throat> very, very excited, and in brilliant English, said, you're here. You're here. The guru's been waiting for you. Well, I looked at him and I said, look, I don't, I don't know who you're expecting. It's certainly not us. We weren't planning to come here. We're just walking along this path and we saw the flag. I'm, I'm sure you mean someone else. He said, no, 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 no. The guru's been waiting for you. He's got a question for you. Oh, I said, then you certainly have the wrong prop person because I don't have anything that a guru would need to know. We're, we're just walking through the hills. I'm, I'm sorry to disturb you. And he said, no, please, please. You're the ones from New York, right? Well, we were. We are. So we crested the top of the hill and we saw on the, on the top, um, we saw a little bit of a temple that was being rebuilt. So my first thing that came through my mind is, oh, they're probably going to ask us for money. Now, Nepal is a poor country, and I was prepared to give them money, but, but that wasn't it at all. They, they took us over to, the, to that little uh, halfway built uh, temple house there, and they introduced us to the guru. And indeed, the guru had a question for me that only I could answer. And I have to tell you, I've never told that question to anyone else. Because the question itself wasn't as important as the fact that I realized that each of us has something in us, at more than one thing, that is valuable enough that other people want to know it and should know it. We have innate value as human beings to each other. And when we can recognize that and realize that and start to share it, our world becomes a much better place. So I invite you to think about what it is that the guru might have asked you that only you would know. Okay, so let's go on to change and learning. If we're going to talk about transformation, change, um, we're really not interested just in change for change's sake. You know, the light is on, the light is off. That's change, but that is it meaningful change. No, we want to talk about learning and growth. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to use a model that I've adapted from a very uh, famous scientist uh, in those circles where, that know about him. Um, most of you probably, if you've heard of him, you think of him as the husband of Margaret Mead. But uh, his name was Gregory Bateson. And he was an unusual individual. He was a, a scientist in the sense of he was a mathematician. He was an evolutionary biologist. He was a spiritualist. Um, he was very, very interested in how systems learn and how systems grow and change. Um, and so um, I'm going to show you my uh, slimmed down version of his model because it's something that informs the way that I understand both how people work and how stories impact people. He basically talked about levels of learning. He's a mathematician. He's a scientist. He, he wants to have a taxonomy of things to, to uh, facilitate discussion, and it's a good thing. So he has four levels of learning. But being a mathematician, he starts at level zero. And level zero is reflexive change, almost that on-off light switch where there's change but no learning is involved at all. And to, to give you an example, um, think of sitting in the doctor's office. You've got your, you're going to have your regular exam. The doctor wants to test your patellar reflex, so you cross your, your legs. The doctor taps your knee with a special uh, hammer, and your foot flies up into the air if she happens to tap it right. Um, and you don't think about that change. You don't devote any attention to it. It's just pure reflex. 
a stimulus response. And it's always the same response. If you, if you tap the knee properly, the foot will always do the same thing. That's level zero. That's change, but with no learning whatsoever. It turns out that's going to be critical to understanding how, how learning happens. The next level, level one, is where there is some change. But it's change within a known set of alternatives. So, as an example, let's say I asked you what the square root of 73 was. Chances are, I hope you don't know what that is off the top of your head, but you know that it's a number. It's not an apple or a fruit. It's not a color or a place. It's a number. So that's the known set of alternatives. And if somebody asked you what the square root of 73 is, you'd have a variety of ways of figuring out what that was. And when you came up with the answer, you might retain it, you might not, but there would have been a change within a known set of alternatives before you knew, be, before you didn't know the answer and after you did. Now, had I asked you what is 2 plus 2, you would have immediately said 4. In fact, you would have probably started to say 4 before I said the second 2, because that's a reflex. That's something that at one point in your life you didn't know at all. You had to figure it out. And now you've heard that so many times that you know 2 plus 2 is 4. And it's sunk from level 1 to level 0. In other words, you've learned it. Now, you might have learned it imperfectly so that it's not a complete reflex, but you can understand that, that there is some um, learning. And that's what Bateson defines as learning, is that, as that premise sinks lower. Now, in order to get to that level 1 change, that square root of 73 or 2 plus 2 before you knew what it meant, you had to devote a certain amount of attention to that. You had to think about it and make a decision, maybe make some calculations. But there was some devotion of your attention during that period of time. Now, it wasn't anything spectacular. If somebody had tapped you on the shoulder, you would have immediately paid attention to them. But there was a little bit of attention that you were devoting to that. That's the second most important part. Because at level two, which is where things really get interesting, especially for storytelling, we've got a change in context. There's a new set of alternatives you're going to have to choose from, and in, in particular, an unexpected set of alternatives. Let me give you an example. Imagine, if you will, that you're sitting in a cafe, and the cafe is warm and cozy, and you're surrounded by people who are just pleasant and having a good time. Um, and as it happens, sitting across the way from you, there's an attractive person who is flirting with the person sitting next to you. Now, if you're like me, you've got the best seats in the house. You get to see this flirtation taking place. And so you sit there and you watch the person across from you flirting with the person next to you. And then something happens. And you realize they're not flirting with the person next to you. They're flirting with you. In that moment, you suddenly have to decide, how am I going to react? Because you're no longer the observer. <laughs> you're the participant. Okay? And your context has suddenly shifted. And in so doing, you will have had a number of physiological reactions to that moment. Some of you may have heard it just imagining it happening. It happens to a lot of people. Your face might have flushed a little bit. Your heart rate would have accelerated. Your breaths might have become more rapid. All those things are biologically compelled because we've been surprised with a new context. Now, you might decide you like the flirtation, you don't like the flirtation, you're going to ignore the flirtation. All those things, those are level one changes that you're going to make once you understand which context you're in. But until you can get that context, you're at a level two. Now, the other thing that's going on at level two is that you've stopped paying attention to anything that's around you. Now, imagine yourself in that circumstance. The people around you would fade away. You'd just be zeroed in on that person across from you who's flirting now with you. And Bateson and evolutionary biologists would say you're in danger at that moment. 
you know, because there could be something else coming on, coming your way, and you're not paying attention to it. So that biological imperative to quickly resolve which context you're in is is actually pretty strong. That's why you're, you start pumping more blood and breathing more quickly and everything narrows because you want your brain to have all the energy it possibly can to make this quick decision about which context you're in. You know, the old saw about the caveman and the, and the, uh, and the saber-toothed tiger would, would apply here. If you're going around a, a large boulder and you suddenly see a saber-toothed tiger, you've got to very, very quickly decide which way you're going to run. Are you going to, are you going to run this way? Are you going to run that way? Are you going to remain stock silent? All those things have to be decided like that. Because there might be another t- tiger waiting for you. And you have to get that budget of attention back to you for your good use. So now, if you encounter that rock again or that cafe again, you might say, wait a minute, I remember this. Um, And I'm going to go right instead of left. I'm going to avoid the tiger or whatever it is that you decide to do. Um, And that would have sunk that stimulus from a level two to a level one because now you have a known set of alternatives. The practical real world application of this is uh, imagine that, and some of you unfortunately have had this experience, I know I have, of being laid off. Um, When you walk into that office and you're not expecting your pink slip and the boss tells you, you know, this pack your boxes, this is your last day, there's a moment of level two there. You weren't expecting this. All of a sudden, you're rushed with I'm going to make the mortgage. I'm going to make the college payments. All those things start going through. Maybe, thank God, I'm finally out of this place. I hate it so much. Anybody in HR who's training managers will tell them, and they're right, that in those first two or three minutes, you could be speaking absolute gibberish to the person being laid off, and it wouldn't matter because they're not hearing you. Their budget of attention is entirely focused on the shift in context that they have to resolve. So... Um, that's something that unfortunately happens all the time. And that's part of what uh, Bateson would describe as a level two change. Now, he did actually have another level, and I'll mention it briefly here because it turns out it is useful. But uh, it's a level three change, and this is where Bateson would say there's a new actor. So it's not just the context that's changed, but who you are as an individual changes. Now, the reason he invented this or came up with it was to say there are um, times when um, you want to be able to describe what it is to have a very intense spiritual experience where you feel like you're just a, a grain of sand on the, on the ocean of the, of the universe. And the one thing that to know about that is that it's an, another exponential increase in the, in the loss of your budget of attention. Um, that's the main difference between level one and two level three is that all of you is consumed and it takes longer to resolve that and you're in greater evolutionary danger when that, when that happens. Now, it turns out Bateson didn't know about um, some things uh, at the time he was coming up with this, but it turns out that a level three change is very, very close to what somebody with some severe PTSD goes through when they're triggered. Um, All of a sudden, they forget who they are, or they find themselves as another character in another position. And and those are extremes, but this level three describes that and how hard it is on the individual, the individual body, to manage that. So to recap, learning comes when we sink our premises from one level down to another level. Whatever that is, that's learning that takes place. So if I I take something I know, but I make it reflexive, that's learning. If I take a new situation and make it into something I recognize, that's learning. All these things are learning. And the further up this, this, uh, uh, these levels we go, the greater the drain on our budget of attention. So that, um, a level one consumes much more attention than level zero, a level two exponentially more level three exponentially more again. So, this is a rubric. Um, it's a lot to consume, but uh, it, it really does help with understanding how it is that we learn and grow and um, what it is that how we're going to put that to use in storytelling will become clear.
So, now we'll shift gears a little bit, and we'll talk about the narrative arc. Now, many of you have heard of the narrative arc. Some of you may even have a conception of what it looks like. It looks something like this. Um, and it's a very generic tool for talking about how it is that stories work, how they work over time. Um, it might resemble a, a mountain path, a, a profile of a mountain to you, and, and there's actually a usefulness in thinking of it that way. Um, but as a graph goes, there's two axes. There's time that goes from left to right. So the story, as the story proceeds, we're going up and down the, the hills and valleys. So as we move through a story, um, the exciting parts are higher up vertically and the relieving parts are further down. So let's take an example, kind of a classic example of how this works. Um, in fact, it's so classic that you can see about a million different stories that follow this model uh, in one way or another. <clears throat> the first thing to remember is that for every story, there's a protagonist. Certainly every, pro every transformational story, there's a protagonist. Somebody who's the subject of the story. It might be that they're telling the story or that the story is being told about them. But they're the hero, if you will, if you use Joseph Campbell's term, um, of the story. That's one thing that's important. The second thing that's important is that they have an object of their desire. They have some yearning. Um, in a romance novel, it's for a partner. And uh, we might, uh, it could be anything that the protagonist is yearning for. Then... Um, the third and final element of this is that, uh, oh, and, and it's, it's not immediately available to them. And there are obstacles between them and their, their object of their desire. Um, and these will be represented by these, these hills that we go up, these peaks that we have to climb. And in each case, as the story emerges, we, we go up that first hill and we encounter some kind of obstacle. Um, we do battle with the obstacle and the hero motif, uh, overcome the obstacle, and uh, move on to the next one. This is repeated over and over until finally um, the final obstacle is overcome. The protagonist is united with his or her object of desire and the denouement. All is well. And you can see that the, the story will take on those different energetic levels. There's a little release after each uh, after each obstacle is overcome. And finally, the big one comes at the very end. If that happens to remind you of the physical act of making love, it's the same curve. And there's no, uh, there is no coincidence there. So that leads us to neuroscience and how it is that these things start to work in our body and, uh, and our mind, which are really all one. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole lecture on neuroscience and neurobiology and neuroanatomy, but I do want to be able to talk about a couple important things. Um, you should know that we're made up, our nervous system is made up of these wonderful types of cells called neurons. And there are two, um, well, there's some important parts of a neuron. One is that the uh, a signal moves from the nucleus, from the heart of the the, the um of the neuron to out through a sheath, the axon, to a dendrite, which is uh, the receiver at the other end of the um, at the other end of the the neuron. So, if you look at this particular uh, drawing, they're imagining that a signal is passing from the far left, going along to a second neuron in the center, and then it's it's receiving and passing that signal along. Um, it's being received by these uh, hairy little things at the end called dendrites. Um, and, and that's kind of all the anatomy you need almost because what, where the magic is really happening here is in the synapse, where that connection is between one neuron and the next. Now, if we look really closely at that particular um, place, we'll see that the two neurons are not actually connected. The axon of one is the one to the upper left, and the, the dendrite of the other is to the lower right. And in between them, there's this gap called a synapse. 
And so as the electrical, electrochemical signal travels along, it, it gets to that gap and it, it has to cross that gap. Well, the way it crosses that gap is you see all these little synaptic vesicles, they're called. They're filled with different kinds of neurotransmitters, which basically says they're going to be the chemical that makes it possible for that signal to, to jump the gap from one to the next. Now, the thing about these neurotransmitters is that there's many, many different kinds of them, and they give kind of a flavor to the signal as it passes from one to the next. Um, you've probably heard of neurotransmitters. In fact, some of the ones we're going to talk about, there's only five that I'm going to talk about, are it may even be familiar to you in other contexts. But we're going to be talking about them today as they have to do with uh, storytelling. So I mentioned there's five. I'm going to group them into two basic groups, those that make us feel good and those that make us feel stress. Uh, pretty straightforward. They all are important. They're all critical to storytelling. Um, the ones, and again, you might have heard of some of these, dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. These are all things that make us feel good. And cortisol and adrenaline are things that make us feel lousy or stressful, or upset in some way. <clears throat> For example, you might have heard of oxytocin. And that's something that is generated uh, in labor and delivery, and it helps the mother bond with the baby. Um, very, very useful. Um, has nothing to do directly with storytelling, that bonding of mother and child, except that it does, and, and you'll see why. So let's take a quick look at each one. Dopamine um, generates focus. When there's a lot of dopamine in our system, when the, our signals are being kind of bathed in dopamine, we're much more focused on what's going on. We're feeling a lot of motivation. Um, we're able to form new memories and access old memories. The memory function is, is pretty strong. Um, how do we get dopamine into our system when we're telling a story? Well, it's the suspense and the cliffhangers in a story that elicit dopamine. Now, another place that dopamine is plays an important role, just to give you a sense of this, is um, folks who are challenged with gambling. <clears throat> now, it turns out that the high that you get from dopamine from the suspense is greater than the high that one gets from the win. So I, get, I feel much, much more better and excited when I'm anticipating the payoff than when I'm getting it, even when the payoff is good. It might not seem to make sense, but that's the way we're wired. So... In a story, we're going to get people really uh, focused and motivated and ready to form a new memory when, when we can elicit dos dopamine through suspense and cliffhangers. <clears throat> Oxytocin, which I mentioned before, is another important one. What does that do? Well, it, it binds us to uh, either someone actually there or someone we imagine. It makes us more generous. It makes us more trusting. It's a wonderful uh, experiment that's been done. Uh, where if you set in, sent in front of the subject of the experiment a bunch of $1 bills and you ask them to contribute a certain number of them to charity, to a particular charity, and they, you say you can have whatever you don't donate, well, if the person takes a little nasal inhaler of oxytocin just before you ask them that question, they'll give far more than they would if they don't get it. It's, it just makes us more generous and more trusting. How do we get that in the story? Well, we get that by uh, evoking empathy from our listeners. So we present them with a situation that they can feel close to or empathic about. The last of the feel-good ones uh, are endorphins. Um, these generate creativity. They generate laughter. They also increase our focus. And they make us basically very, very energized and in a good mood and ready to focus on whatever's coming next. Um, and in a story, they're stimulated by humor. And I have an example of that coming up. So those are the ones that make us feel good. Now, the ones that make us feel lousy, I've, um, I've put together because in a story, we're going to elicit them at the same time with the same tool. Cortisol and adrenaline have a really critical important. And an important thing to do, and that is they give us flashbulb memories. Now, what's a flashbulb memory? Well, if you um, can recall where you were on 9-11, it's probably because you were having a cortisol and adrenaline rush at the time. 
<clears throat> the memory in that flashbulb memory is not just the, the dry facts of where was I or maybe who was I with, but it's the full context. It really is a, this amazing memory that, that gets formed. It includes our feelings, um, you know, our, all of our sensations are all bundled into that. Our emotions are bundled into that memory. Um, now, if you were to get cortisol and adrenaline a lot, it would inhibit our ability to form new memories. Um, but every now and then, it, it plays a very important role. Um, it also means that we can't retrieve other memories as we're in the process of forming this, this memory. It really is consuming um, our budget of attention um, in order to be able to, to form that memory. Along with it also, we can become anxious and, f and fearful. So if you think about that caveman going around to find the saber-toothed tiger, there's a lot of cortisol and adrenaline in, in that moment. How is it generated? Well, it's generated uh -huh, by an unexpected contextual shift, otherwise known as a level two change. All right. So that's what a level two cha change is. The experience of a level two change is a rush of is facilitated by a rush of cortisol and adrenaline. So we're going to put together a perfect cocktail of these five um, of these five neurotransmitters. And I'm just putting them here so you'll have them later on. I'm going to insert them into the narrative arc as we need them. So let's, let's go back to that arc. So remember, the story starts at the left, and, and you probably didn't pay attention to it, but there's a little uptick to the, to the curve on the far left. That's intentional. Um, that's how we get a story started. How do we get a story started? Well, we want to get people focused. We want them to think creatively about the story. We want them to engage with it. And so we elicit some endorphins. How do we do that? With humor. And what do people tell you if you've ever taken a public speaking course? They tell you, start everything with a joke. Well, there's a reason for that. The reason is you're getting these endorphins released into the system so that people will be, be able to pay attention to you and be more creative. And that's a good thing. It happens to be the best way to get that going is with a joke. So next, we hit that, that little, that first, tr first trough, and we want to get people engaged now. So we've got their attention. We want them to bond with the protagonist. We want them to trust us as storytellers. So we're going to get some oxytocin flowing. How do we do that? By describing a situation that makes them feel empathetic. And how, what is that going to be? It's the protagonist and the object of their desire. We want them to feel a, an echo of that same yearning that the protagonist is feeling. And so this is a very important stage of the story, and it's aided and abetted by uh, the use of the oxytocin. Now, as we climb up that first hill, um, we want to get people even more focused. We want to get them motivated. We want them paying attention and prime their memory for, some, for a change. And so what do we do? We get dopamine flowing. And how do we get that? We get that through anticipation. So we're building the suspense as we go up to this first encounter with the obstacle. And when we reach it, ba-doom. We want to provoke a little bit of change, maybe a small flashbulb memory, how do we, we want them to remember that moment, the first time that they overcame their obstacle, um, and we do that by the surprise contextual shift. So that'll be accompanied by cortisol and adrenaline. Now we want to let them relax, gather their breath for the next ascent, and so we kind of repeat here. A little more empathy, a little more focused motivation, and then another big, uh, and everyone is always bigger, um, the flashbulb memory by way of uh, a surprise contextual shift. And then when we're all done, we want to end with um, a little more bonding. Uh, so again, we'll get that empathy going and uh, do that uh, to elicit the oxytocin, which is going to have them really cement that relationship with that change that they just had at the mountain peak. If it sounds manipulative, in a sense it is, but in the neutral sense of manipulation, this is how I tell a good story. I tell a good story by taking advantage of what I know is going on inside people's minds and bodies as I'm telling this story, because I want to make them more receptive to it and more able to be creative with what I present them. <laughs>
Now, another thing to know is that there's this thing called neural coupling. And it sounds like uh, sci-fi when you start to hear it. It's very well known and documented. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But what it basically means is that when one person is speaking to another, there's the opportunity uh, for the listeners to actually start to model the brain, the brain waves of the speaker. So the, the brain activity in the listener will start to match the brain activity in the speakers. Now, uh, what that means is they're absorbing more than just the words that are being spoken. They're in, in absorbing the context for that speaker around those, around those words. Interestingly enough, it doesn't work with gibberish. It doesn't work with uh, simple tones. There have to be words involved for this effect to take place, um, or at least recognizable uh, concepts. Um, and we can map... Uh, how these two brainwave patterns sync up with each other. Have you ever had somebody who starts to speak your next word before you do? Do you find that irritating like I do? Well, it turns out that those listeners have not only mapped their brainwave patterns to yours, but theirs are a little in advance of yours. And so they are literally mapping to your brain and saying the word that you are trying to speak because you and their brains are in sync. It's amazing stuff. Now, what becomes particularly important around stories here is that let's say I'm telling stories as a shoemaker. And you're listening and you're not a shoemaker. Well, if I do enough of this, you're going to start to learn and gain a facility for shoemaking, even though I'm not teaching you specifically how to do shoemaking, if I'm speaking in the context of shoemaking. And this, again, something that's been very nicely studied. You, you can then take your first encounter with shoemaking and be able to learn it more quickly and more adeptly if you spend a lot of time listening to stories about shoemaking from a shoemaker. It's, it's a fascinating way that knowledge is actually transmitted um, beyond just the, the specific didactic material that's been uh, shared. What I'd like to do now is share a story with you, a traditional story. And it's a story that will help you understand um, the way that these neurotransmitters and the structure of the narrative arc and all that, how they all come together in a transformational story. Um, and uh, so sit back and listen and, and enjoy the story, um, and then we'll, we'll unpack it a tiny bit um, at the very end before we, we run to the last topic of the, of the course itself. Okay, so this is a traditional story. Um, it's set in Eastern Europe in the early 1800s. It begins in a shtetl, a small Jewish community, very poor. And the hero of this story is a fellow named Yunkel. Now, Yunkel was a thief. And actually a very incompetent thief. Now, when I say incompetent, I don't mean that he tried to rob people and it didn't go well. I meant that he would try and rob somebody and they would beat him up and take his money. It really wasn't a very good proposition. He would keep trying to rob people, and they would beat him up every time and take what little money he had. Well, he was nothing if not persistent, so he decided the problem was that he wasn't strong enough to beat these people up. So he found some other fellows, and they, they joined him, and, and they set off to beat someone up, and, and they beat all of him, them up. Yunkel and all his men got beaten up by this one guy, and they lost their money. Uh, it... They tried it a couple times. It clearly just wasn't going to work. Well, Yunkel sat and thought, and he said, you know, the problem here is that um, we're living in a very small, very poor community. The shtetl, they have no, no money here anyways. We should go off to the road, to the highway that connects all these shtetls, because there are rich people who ride from place to place. They ride in these fancy carriages, They've got lots of money. That's who we should go after. I said, okay. And they 
hid by the side of the road and they watched for a while and they saw all the various different kinds of carts and carriages go back and forth. And finally they saw one very elegant carriage. The horses had all these fine plumage on them and they thought, this is the one. Whoever's in this carriage has a lot of money. So they ran off to, to uh, rob this particular carriage, not really thinking it through that any carriage containing a wealthy passenger and lots of money would have guards. And, and the guards beat Yunkel and his gang up within an inch of their lives. It was pretty bad. So he said, well, we're not even going to try that again. They're all despondent, ready to go home. The uncle said, wait, I got another idea. You know, as we've been sitting here watching these carriages go back and forth, every now and then, remember we see these carts go? And, and they've, they might have a rabbi in them. And he'd be followed by some of his disciples. And when they get to a town, you, you, you know what happens when the rabbi comes. Well, everybody throws money at him, and they offer him food, and sometimes a place to spend the night. I could pretend to be a rabbi, and you could be my disciples, and we could go, and people would throw money at us. Well, it really seemed to be too good to be true. But they said, what harm could it be? So they found a really broken down cart, and they managed to scrape up this old stramel, this old hat for him to wear, and they rode into the next town. And what do you know? Just like Yunkel predicted, people came out. They were excited. They started to throw money at them. It was wonderful. People offered clothes. I mean, the mayor, the mayor of the town came to him and said, Holy Rabbi, I would like to invite you and your disciples to come and be guests at my house tonight. Would you please come and we'll feed you and give you a place to stay? Of course, we'd love to. And they headed off to this mayor's house. House! It was a mansion. There's a room for every one of the men. And as they arrived, one of the men came up to the uncle and said, you know, you finally got it right. This is wonderful. This is perfect. And they went up to their rooms, and there was a bath waiting for each one of them. A bath in every room, fresh clothes. Oh, they could smell the dinner being made. The clanking of the silverware as the tables were set. And when they came down, this great hall was set for them at the head table and the rest of the community. The mayor was putting on such a feast. And... The uncle sat next to him, and he said, Mayor, this is so generous of you. How can we ever repay you? And the mayor said, Well, you, I was hoping you would bless my daughter. Bless your daughter? I'd, I'd love to bless your daughter. Bring her down. I'll give her a blessing right here and now. Oh, Rabbi, he said, She's not well enough to come down. Would, would you come up to her room and, and bless her there? The uncle said, well, yes, I will. I'd be uh, happy to, but um, just how sick is she? Oh, Rabbi, I'm sad to tell you that she's at death's door. And only a rabbi as great as you will be able to give her a blessing that can save her life. I'm afraid otherwise she won't make it through the night. Oh, the uncle's heart was thumping. He followed the mayor up the stairs, his men close behind. As they got to the, stop of the top of the stairs, the mayor opened a door. Sure enough, inside this darkened room, a single candle burning in the back, was this young girl, maybe ten years old, laying down on her bed, definitely close to death. And the mayor pushed the uncle in and closed the door. And time passed. Everyone was standing around in anticipation, waiting. They heard some weeping. They recognized it was the uncle crying. And everybody got nervous. And, and the weeping got louder and louder until finally... Yunkel had burst out into this great wail, and 
everyone was certain that the young girl had died. Finally, the door opens up, and sure enough, there's Yonkel, tears streaming down his face, carrying the young girl. Who's alive? Who's alive? She leaps out of his hands and into her father's arms. Daddy, 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 she's cured. Yonkel, still weeping, goes running down the stairs, his men in close pursuit. He runs out to the lawn and throws himself on the ground. And the men say, Yonkel, where did you learn the blessing to save a life? It's blessing? I don't know any blessings. But you saved her life. I made no blessing. I just raised my fist to heaven and said, What kind of a God are you? What kind of God puts the life of a ten-year-old girl into the hands of a thief? What kind of a God are you? So that's the story. Now, if you look back on the narrative arc, you'll see I started out with some humor. I gave you a couple of false peaks along the way. How are they going to make money? But then that last steepest peak happens at the very end when he learns that the daughter is ill. And that final overcoming of the obstacle is presented in a way, I hope, that was unexpected to you. So let's talk about a little more about transformational storytelling. In transformational storytelling, I mentioned that both the teller and the audience can be affected, can be transformed by the story. Well, in fact, it just so happens that three things change in, one, in an environment like this. The audience changes, and the teller changes, but the story changes as well. And what that means is you can't be reciting a story that you know word for word. It can't be memorized. The difference between this and acting, and there's a lot of acting skills involved in this, is that you have to be prepared to adapt the story to the particular audience and setting as you're telling it. Now, you can't do that if all you've got through the story is a straight line. If this was your map to take a hike through the mountains, it'd be next to useless. You'd know there was one peak that you had to encounter before the other, but what happened if you turn left or turn right? It's, it's useless. Now, those people who hike, and I used to be one of them, know that this is just a profile of a, of a path that you can make a thing called a topographic map. And a topographic map makes lines for each 10 feet, 100 feet, whatever it is, whatever the scale is, um, of the terrain. And so it takes um, a, an object like this and it turns it into a, a map that looks like this, where each circle in this case is a, is a thousand feet. Now, that path that we just looked at is really this path. It's this slice through that, through that uh, particular map. But what you want to know is not just where do I go up and where do I go down, but what is the terrain? What's the terrain of my story? Because today I might take one path up to that peak which is telling the story, if you will, from one person's perspective. And the other way, another day, I may, might head east from the western side. And it'll be an entirely different story, but it'll be in the same terrain. And that means if I take a little misstep here or there, I can find my way back to the path because I know the terrain. And that's key. You have to know the terrain of your story in order to tell it. And that means knowing how to tell it from each character's perspective, including the omnipotent third-person perspective that's so well-known in stories. Um, but you have to be able to tell it with different emotional valences, which is kind of like telling it in different weather conditions. So there's a lot that you have to learn, but there's a model for learning that. 
Okay, so now let's talk about the program. Transformational Storytelling is a two-year program that brings you to the point where you can be able to tell transformational stories, stories that will change you, your audience, and the stories themselves in deep and meaningful ways. It takes four semesters of work. Each semester is, um, uh, there are 10 classes. It runs for about every other week, so it's about four months. And um, during each of those four semesters, we study we uh, concentrate on one particular topic, but we t touch on all four topics across all four semesters. Let me make that a little more concrete for you. Um, one of the four semesters is all about storytelling. And in a moment, I'll show you the specific classes that we have for each, each of these topics. Um, after you complete the semester on storytelling, then there's another sem semester on multi-faith foundations. One of the things that's key to the way I look at transformational storytelling is just like that map, we have to understand the terrain of our map, of our story. We also have to understand the terrain of our spirit. And if I'm only looking at the world through w the lens of one faith tradition or one approach, then I've got a skewed view of the world, no matter which one it is. Now, I still may always want to approach things from the east and head west, but I better know the rest of the terrain. And the way I'll do that is by looking through di the lenses of different traditions. So there's a term on multi-faith foundations of storytelling. Um, there's also a term on spirituality because this is spiritual work. And um, how do we build our own spiritual practice? How do we get to know our own spirituality um, more deeply is key to being able to tell truly uh, transformational stories. And the last quarter, they don't necessarily, uh, you don't have to do them in this order exactly, but uh, the next and final quarter is Jewish foundations. Um, I do concentrate mostly on the Abrahamic religions, very well versed in Judaism and uh, Islam and Christianity. Um, others as well, but we three of us uh, do tend to share these Jewish foundations, so there's work on, on those. And as you'll see in a moment, um, there's, we intermix each of those topics throughout the, throughout the two years. Um, a date you should keep in mind is that the next term begins on January 28th, 2020. So it's coming up um, in a very short period of time. Now, in order to teach this effectively, I'm, I only have my own perspective, no matter how good I think my perspective is. So I also have a number of faculty who participate with me, and we have at least two of them visiting each term. Um, this is all done live. And so uh, we've got Christians and do Jews and Muslims and Sikhs and, and uh, Mormons and you name it, uh, a heathen, uh, a Zen a master, all come and are participating in the delivery of this course. Now, as I mentioned, um, there are topics by semester. I'm not going to go through them in detail here, but you'll see every term has 10 classes. Um, uh, there's a couple of guests, and the following each one is a retreat in which um, all the students who can get together face-to-face -to -face for a long weekend and uh, study and perform. It gives you an opportunity to perform um, and test your skills in front of a live audience um, which you'll be doing during the term anyways, but, uh, but there, it's there as well. Um, the other thing that goes on every semester is there's a, um, I, I offer you spiritual direction because, again, we're working hard on our spirits to get through this. It's not aligned with any particular tradition, uh, but if, um, if you don't have your own spiritual director, I can become one for you for this, for this period of time, included in, in the price of the, um, the program. Which brings us to the tuition. So the tuition, normally, it's $1,000 a semester, so $4,000 over the course of two years. Um, there are 10 classes, as I mentioned. Um, spiritual direction, which I also just mentioned in this retreat. That's all included in the $1,000. The one thing that isn't included is your transportation and lodging to the retreat. Um, that's on your own. Um, you can pay it by a semester or through monthly installments. And um, I'm absolutely convinced that that if you sign up for this, it'll be good for you. And so I, oops, I offer you a, uh, 
no questions asked refund if after two classes you say this isn't for me um it's i'm happy to refund your money i've only had to do that once and it wasn't because the class wasn't right but because the scheduling wasn't really working for this one person but no questions asked if you want your money back it's yours um but there's also a special discount right now so if you will sign up for this term this coming up term and uh reflect the fact that you've been in this class um, by telling me the, the magic discount code MUGGIED, um, I'll give you 50% discount. Uh, in other words, the first term will be $500 instead of 1000 Now, were this a, a live class, then this is the point at which I would be taking questions from people, and um, I'm, I'm really happy to do that. So if you're you uh, are finding this another way and have questions for me, you can find out more about the school at transformationalstorytelling.org by emailing me, Jim Brule at transformationalstorytelling.org. Um, so again, I want to thank you for your time, and I really hope you're in intrigued and encouraged to, to move forward, and I look forward to finding you uh, in class. Thanks a lot.